Hey everyone and thanks for tuning in into my talk about the future of human-machine interaction in optics and photonics. Um, so about how machines will affect our future daily life, whether it's in the workspace, in the public or at home with the help of optical technologies. My name is Stefan Heist and uh, I'm the leader of the working group 3D Sensors of the Imaging and Sensing Department here at the Fraunhofer IOF. And in our working group, we've been dealing with human-machine interaction over the last couple of years, because instead of this well-known example, human-machine interaction should be treated as a, a reciprocal relationship between humans and machines. That means we want to enable a natural and intuitive interaction between humans and machines. And for that to work, we need to develop new technologies, especially in optics and photonics. The reason is, in the fourth industrial revolution, these key components are usually identified as the basis for these main technologies with all the technical topics that are shown here, such as Internet of Things, Smart Factory, Big Data, AI, Cobots, uh, Virtual Reality. And in order to further drive human-machine interaction in the future, it's necessary to integrate new developments and technologies, which involves some challenges, particularly in the context of optics and photonics. Because if you think of um, a human-machine work environment, you don't only need to consider air genomics or psych-related aspects, but also several technical requirements, all to ensure um, establishing qualification as well as competence. Naturally, in our working group, we have focused on technologies to realize a safe, comfortable and carefree operation a contact-free gesture-based interaction by uh, registering multiple modalities, as well as uh, artificial intelligence-based smart learning systems to solve problems and support humans in various situations. As uh, the name of the working group already suggests, we have done this by using 3D sensors, or to be more specific, one of uh, the many different optical three-dimensional measurement technologies, because in general there are lots of approaches to perform optical 3D measurements such as photogrammetry, confocal microscopy, time of flight or interferometry. However, our working group is primarily dealing with so-called pattern projection. The basic setup can be illustrated like this. We have two cameras that observe the measurement object from different positions and a certain object point, which is specified here in homogeneous coordinates, is now imaged onto an image point P, depending on the camera and rotation matrix and the position of the camera center. And the object point and the two camera centers span a triangle on which the two image points so-called corresponding points, are located. In other words, if you have calibrated the cameras beforehand, it means if you know their intrinsic and extrinsic parameters, such as focal length, principal point, lens distortion, or um, camera position, then you can calculate the 3D coordinates of a surface point from the corresponding image points. This might be no problem for such distinctive points, but what about a point like this? Where's uh, the corresponding pixel in the second camera view? Well, at first we can reduce the search area by the following consideration. This pixel is associated with this camera ray, which is defined by the camera center and the image point. So, consequently, Candidates for the corresponding pixel in the second camera view are, for example, these image points. And in general, the corresponding pixel can only be on the image of this ray on the chip of the second camera, which is called the 
epipolar line and which is defined by these equations. And uh, to make life even easier, we can now transform the images so that corresponding epipolar lines run horizontally. In this way, we now only need to search for our corresponding pixel on the same image row. And to solve this uh, yeah, now remaining one-dimensional search problem, we um, now place a projector between the two cameras, which projects a certain sequence of patterns. Very well established and yeah, let's say the gold standard, which has also been used by our working group for a long time, is phase shifting profilometry. This means that um, several phase shifted sinusoidal patterns are projected one after another so that a phase value can be calculated for each point in the two camera views. And I think it's obvious that corresponding points will have the same phase value. Unfortunately, the problem is, just like the sign patterns, these phase values are periodic. That means there are several candidates for our corresponding point, and which of these is uh, the correct one must be determined by projecting additional binary patterns, so-called gray code patterns, and only after that we are able to reconstruct the 3D coordinates of the object point again. Basically, this approach uh, works very well. However, 3D sensors that operate according to this principle are typically too slow for human-machine interaction. So, the question is, how can they be optimized in terms of measurement speed? In general, there are two approaches. First off, technologically, by increasing uh, the projector and camera frame rate, or second off, methodically, that means by using less patterns, but still maintaining the accuracy of the 3D data. Because, after all, in phase-shifting fringe projection, the actual measurement information is only contained in the phase values, that means in the sign patterns, and uh, the comparatively large number of gray code patterns is only required for the identification of uh, the sign periods, that means yeah, for the completeness. And this is certainly quite a mismatch. Um, and the question is, is there an alternative that requires fewer patterns? And fortunately, our answer is yes. Starting from um, the phase shifted sinusoidal patterns with their fixed offset, amplitude, period length and phase shift, we thought we can simply choose these four parameters more or less freely and vary them both spatially and temporally. And the result are such as we like to call them aperiodic sinusoidal fringe patterns. Of course, now uh, corresponding points in the two camera views can no longer be found via phase values, but instead via temporal correlation. For this purpose, we use the normalized cross correlation. That means the gray value sequence of each pixel of one camera is correlated with the gray value sequences of the pixels in the other camera. And the corresponding pixel is then uh, the one with the highest correlation coefficient. That means yeah, with uh, the most similar gray value sequence. What's nice about this is that by spatially interpolating the intensity values of neighboring pixels, um, this assignment can even be made with subpixel accuracy. That means most of our sensors consist of two cameras and one projector, which projects a sequence of aperiodic sinusoidal patterns. And the corresponding point um, is then found by detecting the most similar temporal gray value sequence and we're able to reconstruct um, the object point by triangulation again. Of course, this is done for all the camera pixels so that we can obtain a complete 3D point cloud. 
This approach is already very promising, uh, but of course it still can happen that the measurement object, so in, in case of human-machine interaction, um, the person moves too much during the pattern sequence, which again leads to errors in the point assignment. And it's therefore worthwhile to um, also look into technological approaches for speeding up 3D sensors, especially new projection principles, which of course must not only allow fast pattern changes, but also have a sufficiently high radiant flux due to the uh, necessarily short exposure times. And in addition, in particular in the context of uh, human-machine interaction, such projectors should, be, uh, should not be laser-based, but they should contain incoherent light sources, and they should be as irritation-free and um, yeah, eye-safe as possible. Unfortunately, all these conditions are fulfilled by our Gobo projection principle by the Gobo projection of aperiodic sinusoidal fringe patterns, which we introduced a few years ago. Such a Gobo projector consists of a light source, a concentrator which collimates the light, then the Gobo itself, which is basically a slide with patterns, and the imaging optics. And, uh, for obtaining aperiodic sinusoidal fringes, we use a gobo wheel with aperiodic binary fringes. And uh, in order to generate varying aperiodic sinusoidal fringe patterns, we slightly defocus our binary fringes and rotate the gobo wheel. And this uh, can be done continuously at potentially high speeds so that we were able to measure extremely fast processes, for example, such a car crash test, or even airbag explosions. And in general, there are several benefits of Gobo projection-based 3D sensors. And one of them is that they are almost wavelength independent. So they can be built with light sources with wavelength outside the visible spectral range, for example, in the near-infrared or short-wave infrared. And this is extremely interesting for human-machine interaction or uh, yeah, 3D measurement of uh, faces in general, because 60 years ago, Böttner and Walter investigated um, the spectral transmittance of the human eye in the... Um, ultraviolet up to the shortwave infrared spectral range. So let's say a light ray hits the cornea with an intensity of 100%. After the cornea, the ray um, hits the aqueous. At some spectral ranges, only a small portion of the light is transmitted. So the ray travels through the aqueous, the lens the vitreous, and at the end, this blue portion reaches the retina. And as you can see, at 940 nanometers, 50% of um, the incident radiation hits the retina. And at 850 nanometers, it's still 80%. However, there is a range where no radiation can be detected already after the aqueous. So that means that it's not only irritation-free, but also an eye-safe pattern projection. That's why we developed several different sensors in numerous projects. For example, the two systems shown here. Um, one working at 850 nanometers with an additional RGB camera so that the color texture can be mapped onto the 3D point cloud and another sensor at um, 1.45 microns, where it's not only irritation-free, but also eye-safe. And it uh, also operates independently of skin color or hair color, as you can see, um, because all the colleagues we measured, whether of Asian, Latin American, 
uh, or Indian ethnicity could be reconstructed very well as um, the fringe pattern modulation is almost the same. These uh, sensors can be used in different applications, for example, for biometric authentication, because apart from other biometric features such as signature, voice and so on, probably the most common authentication method is face recognition. Especially 3D face recognition uh, because it allows a highly reliable person identification in many different areas. But of course, 3D face measurements are also essential for various medical applications and which uh, brings us back to the main topic for human-machine interaction. So now that we can three-dimensionally measure humans without blinding them, it's time to consider whether we can capture even more information than just the geometry. And the answer is yes, by using so-called multimodal 3D sensors. The basic principle is quite simple. We combine the image data of different spectral ranges by extending our 3D sensor, which, as we now all know, consists of a pattern projector and two cameras. And um, we extend this sensor um, with a potentially large number of image sensors, for example, a color camera, thermal camera, polarization camera, and so on. For example, in this sensor, we combine 3D data with um, a color image, a shortwave infrared texture, and a thermal image. And uh, because we're doing this at video rate, we're calling it 5D imaging as we have three spatial, one spectral, and one temporal dimension. Altogether, from uh, that data, we can derive several vital parameters, uh, such as um, a person's heart rate or oxygen saturation, body temperature. Unfortunately, most of these parameters are not directly observable, but require sometimes complex calculations, filtering, and so on. Um, so in general, it's not sufficient to yeah, only build and uh, develop multimodal 3D sensors, but data processing and analysis are equally important. And uh, they usually involve the following steps. First, of course, transferring um, the recorded images to the memory, then performing our um, correspondence search, reconstructing the 3D point cloud and, uh, if applicable, mapping the multimodal data, um, then analyzing, evaluating, or visualizing the data, transferring it to the output device, and sometimes even more steps, for example, all this is done in uh, this video mirror we have built. Uh, so, as you can see, even when the machine yeah, knows how to react or what to do, what to show and so on, it's still a difficult task in terms of data processing and analysis speed. Further examples from other projects we have worked on in the past years uh, especially within the Innovation Alliance 3D Sensation uh, is this system for flexible inspection planning by controlling a sensor system or multiple sensor systems using pointing gestures. In this case, um, the user shows yeah, like the, the most interesting part of a large object. This gesture is observed and interpreted by our 3D sensor with a large field of view. And the second 3D scanner at a robot arm is moved to this specified region of interest and captures uh, a high resolution point cloud. Another example for a gesture-based robot control is this system which we developed to demonstrate the principle in a yeah, kind of a playful way. Um, there, an, a near-infrared 3D sensor captures the interaction area, which is in this case some 
kind of membrane. The 3D point cloud as well as the surface change are shown on two displays and the robot arm is moved towards uh, the deepest membrane indentation. And of course, as you can see, the goal is to hit the wide spheres as often as possible, which can be uh, quite fun, especially for kids. Yet another serious application of such a system is, for example, in the field of welding, where the sensor head can be controlled by gestures to yeah, follow complex shapes and motion paths during a welding process. Applications in the medical field are also conceivable, for example, by activating or motivating elderly people or disabled persons through acoustic feedback. That means by yeah, letting them control the melody or tone pitch through their movements. Uh, from an outside perspective, this might seem uh, somewhat strange, but uh, the participants in this particular project had a lot of fun with this interactive music system. And in a similar way, such rehabilitation robots could be realized in the future. Also in the field of radiotherapy, our sensors are used. For example, a real-time 3D sensor network consisting of Three irritation-free large field 3D scanners tracks the patient's um, position during treatment and even the breathing motion. And this ensures that only the intended area is irradiated. And last but not least, we investigated whether 3D point clouds can be used for speech recognition, for example, if you don't want to, or because of ambient noise, uh, cannot use a microphone. And when tracking the movement or dimensional change of one of these 68 facial landmarks, for example this one, we obtain such a diagram. And as you can see, there's not only some movement in X and Y direction as a result of opening and closing the lips, but also in the Z direction, that means vertical uh, to the front face. So our 3D scan provides us with additional information compared to just using 2D cameras. Another challenge or technical requirement of human-machine interaction I'd like to give you a brief insight into is learning capability. Such a learning capability can be useful, for example, for quality control during an assembly process. And in one of our recent projects, we developed a sensor that three-dimensionally records a human and the different pieces in an assembly workstation. And the goal is to automatically detect errors during the assembly while at the same time supporting any valid sequence according to the digitized assembly plans. For this purpose, we continuously monitor the assembly area during mounting, uh, usually without interrupting the workflow. And in each scan, about 1 million 3D points are used to locate the position of the components, which are recognized and uh, segmented by using an additional RGB camera. In this way, it's possible to ensure the correctness even of customized assemblies, that means of groups that are based on a basic assembly, but with customer-specific adaptations. Um, but this project is just an example of the use of artificial intelligence. But there are so much more potential applications of AI in 3D sensor technology you can think of and because in all steps from image acquisition through sensor calibration up to data calculation and evaluation, there are countless new opportunities by using artificial intelligence. And that's why I want to focus on just a few examples. The inner volumetric data analysis for fused uh, filament fabrications, that means 
for um, the layer by layer 3D printing of objects with melted plastic. The approach is to capture the 3D topology of each extruded layer and compose the individual topology information for the inner volumetric model. In case of this toy boat, this results in more than 10 million 3D points in 476 layers. Of course, uh, the hull curve of this fabricated object can then be compared to the reference model to determine geometric deviations. But it's also possible to assess the inner structure for process monitoring and control. And this can be done by using artificial intelligence. More specifically, by evaluating each individual layer by an AI-based um, semantic segmentation and by comparing it with the simulated influence of different process parameters such as the flow rate, which is shown on the right side. And this way it's possible to yeah, provide the best parameter set during the process. That means to make in-process adjustments to obtain an optimum 3D printed result. For this purpose, we have um, developed a statistical process model with regression analysis. We use a semantic segmentation to detect features in each layer and compare them with the ground truth. And by predicting the characteristics of the next layer, based on our statistical model, we can iteratively adjust the process parameters. Of course, for tasks like um, automatic semantic segmentation, it can be very beneficial to use multimodal 3D data instead of just plain 3D point clouds. As you can see in this example where we used 3D data, color texture and temperature to isolate unknown objects in our data sets. Because while um, yeah, the pure 3D data already provides a reasonable segmentation result, it gets better and better the more modalities you include. And that's why in this case the XYZ RGB temperature data set leads to the most reliable segmentation. Last but not least, I'd like to very briefly show the results of another project in which we used artificial intelligence for interpreting the 3D environment to ensure a safe human object interaction. A 3D sensor detects um, distant objects in the environment and a multimodal 3D data is used to build dynamic 3D scene models. And a safe interaction can then be made possible by object classification and tracking, obstacle detection, recognition of simple gestures, um, automated um, guided vehicle feedback, and so on and so forth. Overall, I hope that all these examples I have shown have made it clear that optics and photonics are key for the future of human-machine interaction. All of what I presented is of course, the result of teamwork, and that's why I want to thank all my colleagues from our department, Imaging and Sensing at the Fraunhofer IOF. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions now in the Photonics for Future Q&A session.